So now let's turn to the life and ministry of Christ and kind of get a big overview of what he did in his life. So Christ's ministry was preceded by a brief ministry of his forerunner, John the Baptist. We see this in John uh, chapter 1, verses 19 to 34. And so he is his forerunner and he prepares the way. He's kind of like the prophet and announces uh, that the Messiah has come. Uh, Christ was baptized by John, and this is usually seen as the beginning of his ministry. And Christ usually speaks in Jewish places. Now, there are a couple of occasions where they're not Jewish places, but at least they're places in, you know, in connection with the Jewish world. So, after his temptation in the desert, this is usually seen as the very beginning point of his ministry, Christ then goes and selects his disciples who will continue his work after he leaves. So he selects these people thinking and training them for carrying on the gospel. Then the wedding of Cana takes place where he turns water into wine in John 2. And then comes a very short visit in Jerusalem where he cleanses the temple and runs out the money changers in the temple. And then he speaks with Nicodemus in chapter 3 and tells him about new birth uh, rebirth, that is, birthing of the Spirit. And then he explains the very spiritual nature of his ministry in that chapter as a kind of a new birth and a new life, and one must be born again. Christ then returns to Galilee through Samaria, where he encounters a woman at the well. And in there he tells her that he is the living water. Of course, he tells her, as she said, everything that she ever did and many people begin to believe in him. Now, Samaritans are um, part Jew and part Assyrian, kind of a mixed, uh, mixed breed, mixed race, and Jews didn't like them for that reason. But Jesus is reaching out to them nevertheless, and to women, which was uh, extremely rare for that day. Uh, in fact, the passage talks about how his disciples were surprised uh, that he was speaking to a woman. So the ministry scope was not limited by nationality, uh, not limited by gender, uh, racial, or social barriers. So he is, uh, from the outset, looking to uh, share the gospel with the whole world, even though it starts with the Jewish world. He then goes on to Nazareth. This is his hometown where he grew up, and he was rejected there. Of course, the famous phrase that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country comes from uh, this visit, and then he moves on from Nazareth up to uh, Capernaum, where he sets the base of his, uh, the main part of his ministry around the Sea of Galilee. And so he will do three tours around Galilee uh, with his disciples, preaching, doing miracles, and so forth and so on. And this ministry com comprises uh, the largest part of his earthly ministry. Now, there are many healings of, uh, of different types. There are all kinds of miracles, nature miracles, food miracles, um, healing miracles, and so forth and so on. All kinds of parables where he teaches people with a kind of folksy wisdom and, and examples that they can understand. And then, of course, there are famous um, addresses, sermons, and the most famous being the Sermon on the Mount which is usually seen to be his signature teaching. We'll look at that a little closer here in just a minute. But the core idea here is that true religion follows the spirit rather than the external acts demanded by the law, this legal form of, of uh, judicial righteousness that the Pharisees had uh, been embracing for a long time. So his teachings on the kingdom of God also emerge from these parables, that the kingdom of God is kind of like a new a new order, and it's not a military uh, conquest like so many of these Jewish groups have been expecting. Even his disciples, it takes them a long time to begin to grasp the idea that Christ's kingdom is not of this world, it's a spiritual kingdom. Uh, even right before he leaves, for example, and goes and ascends to heaven, his disciples ask him, are you now going to establish your kingdom here on, you know, essentially here on earth? And he's, he, and he's been telling them over and over again, and he realizes they won't understand until I leave and the Spirit comes. And so, but right up to the very last moment, his disciples uh, 
thoroughly Jewish men are thinking that somehow or another Jesus' kingdom is going to be an earthly kingdom. Uh, the extended ministry in Galilee was followed by a short ministry in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. Here he's going to face all kinds of opposition uh, from different religious leaders, from the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth, the Sadducees, who don't like his message and are afraid of it, and especially afraid of the, his popularity among the people. And because of this opposition, Jesus will take his disciples and they'll retreat over to the other side of the Jordan River to Perea, where he will continue his ministry there for a short time. But the Perean ministry was succeeded by a very short ministry in the last week uh, in Jerusalem, during which he meets all kinds of rising opposition and antagonism from the Jewish national and ecclesiastical leaders. He rebukes their mechanistic form of righteousness and their legalistic form. It's an external form of righteousness. And he teaches them with all kinds of parables. Uh, and sometimes he's teaching this so that they can't quite understand what he's saying. Uh, but he was very good at teaching the people and getting them to understand his message. But at the same time, he knew when he was trying to be trapped. And there are all kinds of episodes. Uh, the most famous, of course, is where uh, he was asked if it was okay to pay the taxes to Caesar, which was an onerous burden the Jews hated. And so he asked for a coin. And he says, whose inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And he, of course, famously says, well, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. So uh, there were five different um, competing views uh, that are going to emerge about his death and resurrection, okay? But the, his, his life is going to end in a tragedy where he is sacrificed on a cross. He knew that this was coming. He indicated that it was coming, though his disciples didn't want to see it. And each of the Gospels kind of gives a different take on this um, this. Uh, uh, end of his life and the meaning of it and how it's going to transpire. But after this tragic weekend where his life is sacrificed on the cross, uh, he's, he's going to resurrect from the dead. Now he would be buried first in a famous tomb. He's going to be buried in a, a tomb of a very wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. So there's no accident about where the tomb is. Okay, That's an important part of Matthew's account of this. Uh, but uh, he is going to uh, be buried there and then at, on the third day uh, resurrect from the dead. And of course this will uh, excite his followers, uh, rejuvenate them, rehabilitate his image, and so forth and so on. Okay, we'll, we'll look at that passage a little bit closer here in a minute when we look at the passage in Matthew. But anyway, the culmination of his ministry will come with his ascension to heaven, as I've already mentioned, in the presence of his disciples, in which he says he will send the Holy Spirit in his place, uh, and that eventually he will personally return to earth. So until that time, many Christians, or most Christians, have awaited his second return.